We're going to move next to HLTP 5, High Leverage Teaching Practice 5, which is focusing on cultural products, practices, and perspectives, also in a dialogic context, meaning that it's going to be based on conversations and interaction. And in this particular High Leverage Teaching Practice, our authors from um, the book that this whole course is based on, which is called Enacting the Work of Language Instruction, High Leverage Teaching Practices by um, Eileen Gleason and Richard Donato, they actually say that learners in this particular practice, learners go beyond simply describing behaviors and learning um, about cultural customs and memorizing historical facts in order to actually arrive at transcultural competence. And a little bit like our previous high leverage teaching practice, this one also has an acronym that serves as a model or a process for us to use. In this case, it's the image model for exploring cultural perspectives, I-M-A-G-E. The first step is um, examining multiple images and making observations and then analyzing additional information that the teacher brings in, or sometimes the students might help to bring some of that in. Um, generating hypotheses about cultural perspectives based on the initial images and then based on the additional information. And then exploring those perspectives more deeply and reflecting further. So the lesson is developed around a series of cultural images that will lead students to make cultural observations and draw conclusions. So again, it's very learner focused, just like in high quality project-based language learning, we're looking at it from a lens that is learner focused. Um, Dialogue-based interactions in the target language about the cultural images and the students' observations and their, their hypotheses is promoted through a series of carefully scaffolded teacher questions in two categories, fact questions and thought questions. As you might imagine, fact questions ask students to make specific observations about what they see in the images, whereas thought questions move the learners to analysis by requiring them to share hypotheses and ideas that go beyond the surface of the image and start to go to what are the cultural perspectives that this image is helping me uncover. Um, so in looking at that, um, you can see that, for example, through these images, students can explore cultures through the lens of how language is used in society's daily conversations, in the media, in the slogans and advertisements, and texts of various kinds, such as web, pa web pages, new pa newspaper articles, and literature, among many other things. And not to ignore just simple photos, for example. So we're going to move to um, interviewing our guests about this particular high leverage teaching practice. And we're going to start with Megan. Um, Megan, as learners encounter cultural knowledge that challenges stereotypes they have held, they may initially show resistance to the more nuanced understanding of the target cultures and their perspectives. And the high leverage teaching practices actually acknowledge that this resistance is the first stage in developing cultural understanding. So how can high quality project-based language learning acknowledge students' place on the cultural knowledge continuum and help move them towards deeper and deeper cultural understanding and awareness? That's something that I, uh, I would like to keep learning uh, more, uh, more about as I continue with this process. There were a lot of discoveries for me when I, when I taught this. The first one starts when I had the students measure their carbon footprint and then measure it against uh, their Chinese classmates. Uh, and what they discovered, the fact that they discovered, was that the Chinese classmates have a lower carbon footprint when they're living in China, but when they come to the United States, they have a higher carbon footprint. So that, in a sense, caused our students to be more self-reflective about what it means to be in the United States and what is it how that our lifestyle encourages a higher uh, a higher carbon footprint, um, and it moved them towards thinking about, uh, but what, it, maybe it's because the students are traveling from China to come and study in the United States. And it got the students to think, oh, but then we're also participating in this because we love China and we're traveling to China. So we're also, when we go to China, we're, we're also increasing our carbon footprint. So it really began with that there, with sort of a nice, a nice thing about what do we do with, uh, with, um, uh, both the sort of the, the commonalities of uh, coming to the United States and having this carbon footprint uh, and also a sense of social responsibility um, 
to the to the climate and to the uh, to the earth, but also the sense of we also really need to have these cultural exchanges. And how can we do these cultural exchanges in a more responsible way? So that really started off a, a question for the students that it was helped me to lead to additional texts, not just the PSAs. Uh, where they would pick a favorite PSA and talk about it and why, but it also uh, where there's a Chinese students that had engaged in their own conferences for, for climate change. And so it was a way for the students to also reflect about how active students in China are um, with, uh, on climate action and sustainability efforts and how active or inactive the students are um, on our campus or in the United States in general. So there was a lot of this sort of going back and forth of also learning about themselves while they were also learning uh, uh, about the target culture. And it seemed uh, there are sometimes were moments where I had to push a little bit more to ask them to go a little bit further if they weren't yet ready to, for instance, respond to the fact like, what do I do if I'm uh, if I'm going to go to China and I'm gonna increase my carbon footprint, what does that mean? Uh, how do I understand this and how do I understand myself? Uh, uh, but as the as as we moved forward, I think uh, the, the very variety of the students then began to um, sort of situate themselves in a more comfortable uh, position of uh, uh, feeling comfortable engaging uh, without judgment of the Chinese culture and uh, practices there. Thank you. Uh, first of all, what you just touched on right there, that whole engaging without judgment, this is such a huge part of what we're trying to help our learners build is that that capacity to, you know, first see and acknowledge and discover cultural perspectives that may differ from their own and then value those without, without judgment. But another thing I, I think is really important for our viewers to notice is how the image, which in this case was kind of the statistical data comparing our students' carbon footprint with their pen pals' carbon footprint in China, that led to questions that were students student generated and their own desire to do something, but also find out more, look up, as you said, additional texts that weren't necessarily originally planned to be part of the learning experience and so on. So I really wanted to draw attention to the fact that these images, when carefully selected and then brought to our learners with, with, an, with an opportunity to discuss and really dig into them leads to the learner's own questions becoming the basis for the ongoing learning experience at that particular time. Laura, did you want to share something about that? I, I, don't, I don't want to contradict you, but I do want to say that I enjoy making them tap into their judgmental sides. Of with, course. For the authentic text, um, rather than having them uh, interact with the text with, without judgment, I have them judge that and then question their own judgment. My favorite example is when we were preparing the visitor videos, because of course one of the main attractions is food. So I had an infograph about uh, the most popular foods in Peru or what the Peruvians were most proud of. And you better believe that Cui was on the list, uh, which is guinea pig. And there I had some traumatized kids that day in my class. And so we had to stop and have a conversation, another key English time. I'm like, all right, guys, now why do you think that's gross and not chickens? Because, you know, Suzanne over there has a pet chicken and you've all seen her, seen her photos of her dressed up and everything and how much she loves her. So why is this different? And they're like, I know, but I'm still sad. So like they're, they're questioning their own judgments that they're making. But they're also, another thing that, an assumption that was challenged by that same infographic was, um, of course, they expected there to be a lot of Spanish influence on the food. Um, they weren't too surprised about Italian influence, but they didn't realize there was such a huge Chinese influence on Peruvian food. And so when we were introduced to some of the students that they would be meeting, and a couple of them did have some Chinese and Japanese ancestry, then they had a little bit more background to like, yeah, these these kids are Peruvian too. And same as you guys are all American and you don't all look the same. And so it, it challenged what they expected and they, they were able to just kind of assimilate it because they kind of had a place to start and having food as a place to start, you, you can pretty much never go wrong. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> so actually, you know what? I don't actually think that was totally a contradiction because getting learners to the point where they value the differing perspectives of others happens in a variety of ways. So there are times where we have to confront 
judgmental viewpoints, stereotypes. I know in my case, I would purposefully, um, there's a, a cultural model using, a, similar to this one, like using images. And I, I went out of my way to find an image um, from a university in Dakar, Senegal, um, and I just put the, I put the photo up and I asked, you know, the, the fact questions first. What do, you, what do you think this is? What do you see? Um, and they were talking about how they see people and okay, where do you think they are? Well, it looks like they're in a class or they're kind of older, maybe a university. Why do you say that? Well, they look older and they're all sitting like they're facing a teacher and so on. And then I asked them, where do you think this is? Um, and because they, you know, they're like, well, we're in French class. It's going to be somewhere where French is spoken. And they immediately said, France. And multiple people said France or somewhere in Europe, and nobody said Africa in spite of the fact that every single person in the photo, and there were dozens of people in the photo, was black. Every person. And that was something like you, Laura, that I did specifically to confront the stereotype that there are no universities in Africa, which is wrong. <laughs> um, so we do a variety of things. We both, we use things that lead to questions and those questions lead to deeper cultural knowledge, but we also use things that we know um, our learners need to face some, some of their own kind of cultural, both cultural perspectives and judgments and things that are portrayed in media that sometimes give wrong impressions. You know, as you said, I know my husband's family is from Peru. I actually happen to know a little bit about Peru's history and, you know, former presidents who were Chinese and so on. And so, but other people, like you said, just don't, don't realize that that's true. Or sorry, Japanese, I think was that case. But anyway, um, so thank you very much for sharing that other, that, that other really key important point. And can you share um, examples of how your implementation, I think you, you really did start to share one, but if you'd like to even go a little bit deeper or share another one, how your implementation of project-based language learning has helped you move beyond teaching culture as, as isolated factoids um, to starting with culture and then integrating it throughout. I, I did want to mention one thing before I forget it um, on the subject of what do you see and stuff like that because since because infographics are one of my favorite things to use um me too one of the one of the first things that i have them see is the words and the cognates so i did want to point that out before i forgot that because i almost didn't do that but as far as culture not just being facts and trivia um i would say the key for project-based learning in general but especially for project-based language learning has to be the audience because we can tell them till we're blue in the face that, oh yes, this will get you better jobs. Oh yes, this will get you into the college. But it, unless they actually have to speak with someone else or engage using the target language with someone else, that you know, it, it makes them feel more com comfortable or more capable you being able to use the target language in any capacity, uh, then they, they don't, there's, some, there's something in the back of their mind that can still tell them that no, they don't really need this. They can really just brush it off. So the people are what take it to the ultimate level i would say like having someone who speaks the target language to interact with especially if you can get someone their age because when i when i brought in for the shark tank when i brought in um parents not their own parents but uh, a grade lower i brought in the parents who spoke spanish they were they were a little bit intimidated by it uh, but like when you bring in other teenagers they're they're tantalized by it uh, or if you bring in um we had the ELL students at uh, the elementary school and where they were all in a program together and that really freed them up a lot and like made them want to you know bridge the gap with these with these little people because like a lot of kids who care about nothing will do go to all the links of the the earth the the ends of the earth for a, a seven-year-old you know so the people the people take it beyond they prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the language is valuable in building relationships and in building an awareness of the world and of themselves. Absolutely. In fact, um, when we've had pen pals come visit us or actually exchange students come visit us from France and I would always arrange while most of the time they're, they're sitting in with their host students classes throughout the whole school day, I would always beg for one day where they spent with my classes and we set up a round table in the classroom 
Um, and in French one, so these are mostly freshmen, they have not had any French before. I don't have a lot of native French speakers to draw from in the community. There are usually no other French speakers as English learners on campus. Um, so in French one, this is a really huge opportunity. And of course, at first they think they're nervous, but we, you know, we've done a lot of inter interpersonal communication. But as you said, Laura, you know, un until they have to talk to someone, they're not sure that this is any more than an academic exercise, right? So when they have that chance to have the roundtable conversation, with actual students who were their age, I, did, I had them do reflections afterwards and they were so not just impressed but really moved by the fact that not only could they understand the gist, as Megan pointed out earlier how important that is, of what was being said, but that they themselves were understood and that was huge. Um, similarly, when I had a family immigrate to us from um, uh, Burkina Faso, they, um, they didn't speak any English when they arrived. And as you said, students who in the past might have done nothing, um, they went out of their way, especially in my fourth year class, which they were sharing with the, with the students who had just immigrated, they went out of their way in every other class on campus to translate instructions for them, help them, you know, help them understand what the assignments were supposed to be about, give them a summary of, if they were supposed to read something in a textbook, give them a summary of it. Because again, as you said, relationships matter and connections matter and connections will go such a long way towards um, really building our learners ability to, to be really thoughtful people outside of our classes and that's going to be a key in our project-based language learning experiences as well i think everybody's hearing tonight how every one of these experiences actually connects our learners with real people with real issues with real topics and as a result the learners are empowered and inspired to move farther than they ever would have if we just looked at language learning as an academic exercise um, Megan, can you share um, a little bit about how interculturality um, plays a role in empowering student agency in their communities and around the world? Um, yes, uh, and what I want to also say that ties to what Laura was saying about how the, her younger students uh, were liked the peers that were a little bit older than them, but not adults in terms of interacting. What I found with the two groups that I had, that the college students really love working with the middle school students. So worked with students that were younger with them um, and were really motivated. And the students that picked the, their peers, their Chinese peers on campus, I think approached it like it would just be a regular academic exercise. And that's something that when I teach that again, I will uh, try to reinforce a little bit more uh, on, uh, but that they, in that sense, fell a little bit more short in what they were able to do. And I think it's because they were feeling more nervous. I think they felt the stakes were higher, much like, uh, as Laura is saying, that some of the students might feel that having parents there, that the stakes might feel a bit higher. Right. Um, so I thought that was an important part of it. Um, the interculturality, um, I'm trying to think, um, I guess as part of that, one of the results of the students from the middle school that worked with the middle school was, uh, so excited that wants to do it again, wants to know how we can do more of it, um, and uh, felt that, uh, so this is what I think two years after I taught it, the taught the course, uh, he comes in to say to me, oh my goodness, it was such an incredible experience. I had to learn about myself and learn better about myself in order to get to know the students and where they're coming from, so the middle school students, and to understand their culture. Um, and as a way to approach their and understand the culture as a way to think about ways that we could work together. So work together on sustainability and, um, and climate action. And that was just, uh, I think, really summed it up nicely about that interculturality uh, in that there's a real self-reflection, but through that self-reflection becomes also an understanding uh, or a gesture towards understanding uh, people of other cultures. Uh, but also understanding their viewpoint uh, and where their 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 point of view and where they where they come from and that actually got the students so excited that when they went to speak with the Chinese students in the middle school um, the Chinese students sometimes didn't understand my students because their pronunciation wasn't 
absolutely spot on. Um, and my students absolutely loved it. They came back excited from the event saying, they corrected our Chinese. Um, and so that my students found this as a, a fantastic reciprocal uh, engagement that it wasn't just my students coming and bringing something to the others, to the, to, the, to the middle school students, but that those middle school students, those, those people in the community were also teaching them. And that was, I think, the real highlight and excitement for, for my students. <laughs> That's really awesome, especially when your learners get excited about the fact that um, these other people really cared about what they had to say and thought enough of them and of what they were trying to say to actually take the time to help them and correct them. Right. Uh, and, uh, and also, I liked what you highlighted about how sometimes we don't know if we've empowered student agency. We saw it in that one high quality project based language learning experience, for example. And you mentioned like a specific a specific time where a learner took the time to come back to you and talk to you about how that had an ongoing impact and how they continue to want to take action on the climate and so on. Um, and high quality project based language learning really is a framework for fostering student agency. So Laura, I didn't know if you quickly wanted to add anything about anything you've seen where with the work you've done with your students with Peru and so on, if, if you've noticed anything about their, their ongoing sense of agency for themselves as being people who can make a difference in the world. Um. I'm going to take it to a little bit more shallow level because my one of my favorite things of all time from the when we first started really doing the Peruvian exchange and connecting it with our school was um, Snapchat streaks that uh, the students were engaging on social media with the students they met uh, through the exchange and then decided to do the exchange themselves so they could continue meeting more people so that I mean they were really just connecting on a on a teenage level and it wasn't it doesn't change the world kind Absolutely. of stuff yeah but it, but like uh, the whole theme of sister cities which is how we did the exchange is peace through people and just and like one of my favorite moments of all time is when i just get to watch the peruvians and the gastonians like walking down the street or walking, walking through the park together and just like being kids together so it's not they're, they're, they're not going to fix you know our carbon footprints but they have a deeper understanding of how human everyone is regardless and like the desire to connect with more people and some of my students who have been on the exchanges are now you know wanting to go to vietnam and to thailand and singapore and and just at everywhere and like never speak english again so like they 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 have just found more of their own humanity by being able to do that and and i one thing i wanted to say about interculturality too is that they are forced to examine what might how they are perceived from the outside like when we talk about the food especially it's like you guys they do not have deep fried twinkies in lima <laughs> and so oh yeah and so and they would brainstorm things that might seem odd to people coming in and they they stop and think about it, like oh we all have these quirks and so they don't like hold it against people when they don't see things the same way and and, you know, and then we got more kids who are still going, I got two of my little babies down there now who, who were in on the first visitor video project. And, and, and it's just a, a joy to see them connecting with, just connecting with other teenagers. That's, that's my high school, I think. But you know what, I really think that if you hadn't facilitated that work from the get go, um, that they wouldn't necessarily have gone out of their way to find those connections. So your work very concretely is helping learners understand who they are and kind of how they sit in the world, understanding how other people are, feel connected to other people, feel excited about being connected to other people. And that is something that isn't happening for every one of our learners. So in its own way, that really is um, an important piece of agency and and kind of transforming how our learners leave us and go into the world. And I also really loved what you said about how interculturality goes both ways because it's interculturality. So it's not just knowing how to navigate appropriately in, in other cultures whose perspectives might be different from our own, but understanding our own culture and what we bring to every interaction that we have, but also how we might be perceived in other places. And it's funny because NPR just this morning, they've been doing a series on um, 
China and America and kind of people in both worlds um, going both ways. And the and one of the things they did today was highlighted some interviews where they asked on a holiday in China, they asked a whole bunch of of people in China, what their opinions were, was the first word that came to mind when they heard America. And then on Memorial Day, they had gone out um, into Baltimore and asked Americans what their first word was that came to mind about Baltimore. Um, and it just reminds me a lot of what you were saying. Can, can I uh, jump in quickly yes. on that to sort of reinforce what Laura was saying? Um, actually, my student is not going to go into climate action. I think he <laughs> wanted to go into law, and now he says, no, I had such an amazing experience. I want to go into teaching. Um, but I think that um, the, these projects, project based uh, learning isn't that one then becomes the, the final product is that one becomes proficient in that field. I mean, I think yeah. of what the variety of projects that Laura is doing is exactly that is sort of fostering yeah. um, the, the lifelong learning, the, the, the comfort at going beyond one's own sort of uh, boundaries to seek out uh, other people and engagement with other people that they wouldn't ever have have done if you had not facilitated that. So it could be almost in that sense any project, but it's really that sort of human contact, that human engagement across the cultures that's really important. Exactly. I think that's. I think you highlight that that perhaps better than I did, where I was trying to highlight that exact same thing, um, and and that it's not about it's never about the project itself project-based learning has always been more about the process and what learners experience and gain as as a result of that when it becomes about a project it becomes often just merely a project um, and it's more about the the opportunities and the authenticity and the connections and and that sense and you know the the different op avenues that they have as a result of these experiences.